said, Simon Leo, you never learn it in your life and you know it. Now, isn't that a wonderful arrangement? Now, well, God provides. You finally come to learn a Gomorrah in Kulin without before you even looked at it, because it happens to be uh, the Gomorrah in Kedushi that you do know. <laughs> How God provides. All right. I think Talmud is a greater thing than learning the Tanakh. Therefore. Wait, wait. The Rambam tells us, the Gomorrah says it. I'm going to take the Baskin, that the Jews should learn all. But if you could only do one <laughs> thing and you want to get the highest between, it's. Talmud. When you learn the Talmud Bavli, the Tatis the, the, the say that you have in them both Gemara and Mikra and, and Mishnah. So you have everything in there. So you have a little of this, a little of that. So. And if a commentator takes, let's say, Rashi, a exact quote, it's just like wearing Talmud because of the exact quote. No, he's only paying according to his understanding of it. But it, it's better to learn with a, a more than one commentary. But what if he does that quote? All right, so like, okay, so uh, therefore, would be learning that particular Rashi be a bigger mitzvah than learning Tanakh? I don't make any such uh, supposition. You have to know everything. You have to learn this. You got to know. I this. didn't say that. I say okay. You have to know everything, but learning more is a bigger mitzvah than Tanakh. Absolutely, because is it? Uh, why is it? Okay, okay, but if learning Rashi holds the right too, and no. learning Rashi is a tremendous study in and of itself. He was uh, a tremendous capacity, and anybody that tries to learn the Gemara without Rashi cannot learn it properly. And there's I, no wait, question wait, about I'm it. Wait, I'm not saying that. And Rashi, I have learned from him from all these years I've been learning. Now, how can I say against my teacher that it's not proper to learn from him? God forbid. The Jews. Rashi was one of the greatest Jews that ever lived. But my, lived. if he thinks exact, it's terrible. Okay. I know, but he's not the only commentary. I know. Just, I'm just saying, if he takes an exact quote that's Talmud, which is greater than Mikra, yeah. it's a greater to learn that than Mikra. In that sense, yes. But prior to uh, learning the no, colon, it's at the end. That's the last mission and the last tomorrow. Well, we'll, uh, we'll go over the uh, mission and the last mission in Perik Hay and Ovos. The shortest mission of the whole, very short mission. Ben Hay Omer from Sara Agra. Ben Hay says, according to the pain, that's the reward. Is it also the effort is the reward? And effort, according to the effort is the reward. It is. You, uh, people do a lot of mitzvahs. Uh, Some yeah. people find it easier to do a mitzvah. Other people find it harder to do a mitzvah. Sometimes, when a person does a mitzvah, and he is, thanks God, he has, he has, uh, family that is engaged in doing mitzvahs and they have a family tradition that everybody is learning the Torah and so it's not so difficult for such a person to continue doing what everybody else has been doing all the time. But if uh, somebody uh, unfortunately is not knowledgeable in the Torah and doesn't know how to do the mitzvahs, it's much more difficult for such a person to do the mitzvahs properly in any way. And if he does a mitzvah, it requires a tremendous amount of, of sacrifice, and not only in the sense that, but also that he has to work harder to do the same thing that somebody else finds it just as easy to do. Now, Almighty God is very generous. He does not go and cheat anybody in any area. Not only does God reward us for the commandments that we fulfill, but he rewards us for the effort we have to put in. We have to put in a bigger effort, it gives us a bigger reward. And that's very generous of God. In other words, it's got nothing to do. May two people can do the identical mitzvah, and one can get a much bigger reward than the other. Not because God is unfair and he's showing favoritism. God, at all. God forbid. God is fair. And because he's fair, if one had to work harder to do that mitzvah, so God gives him a bigger reward. Doesn't that sound very good? So very good indeed. So for two people coming to shul, one piece of person to walk to shul it takes about he just walk a uh, 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 hundred feet. Another person has to walk a thousand feet to come to the shul. So obviously, the one who has to walk a thousand feet has to expend more energy than the one that walks a uh, hundred feet to shul. And hundred feet is a leg cripple that can't use his legs, and he does a super pain and effort. Well. And it may well be. Yeah, it's a good observation. Now, the, um, 
Rabbeinu of Adam Hatanur says on this Mishnah, from Tzara Agro, according to the pain and the reward, we robe Hatzar, according to the majority of the pain that you have to bear, Belimina Torah, when you have to learn Torah, learning Torah is sometimes very hard, especially if you don't know how to learn. It's very hard indeed. And even if you can learn, it doesn't mean that you can learn something to learn is easy, you can learn it, and then you come across something that's very difficult to learn. Even some people that have been learning for many years find sometimes something is very difficult. So there's no question about it that sometimes you come across tomorrow that are very difficult to learn. Even people that have been learning for many years. And then you I know from personal experience, so I'm telling you, I'm not telling you something that so there's some Gemara's, thanks God, you can learn it. If you have uh, the vocabulary and you understand how to learn, in uh, Baruch Hashem, you can make progression. The Gemara's, like tearing the teeth out of the mouth. Every word, every phrase requires explanation. And especially if you don't understand what it's talking about. So yes, you're talking about something that you, you, you're not acquainted with. And so everything has to be explained. Every terminology, every term that's used has to be explained. And it's very difficult to learn under such circumstances. Of course, you can still learn if you are persistent and you really uh, strive to do it. A lot of people use Jastro Dictionary. It is used to, to discover uh, the meaning of difficult words and difficult phrases. And it's very good because it's built on other dictionaries that were Hiroshima and uh, dictionaries. And it's a very good uh, thing. And uh, everybody that learns, especially if you have your principal languages in English, it's written in English uh, with the uh, translation in English. So it tells you what the words mean. And sometimes it takes the laborious you have to do word by word to try to find out what the words mean. Because the Gomorrah is basically Aramaic. Science are basically Hebrew. Aramaic is a sister language to Hebrew. The French and Italian are sister languages. They both have a base in Latin. I thought it also Spanish and Mexican, right? No, Mexican is Spanish and Portuguese would also be. Well, that's why it's pretty close. <laughs> but at uh, any rate, so Hebrew, American. Hebrew and Aramaic are sister languages. And I presume Arabic is also a sister language. So once you get to uh, learn one, it is uh, it's easier to learn the other. Of course, Aramaic has different words, and, and if you're not acquainted with it, it becomes very difficult. That's one of the reasons I admonished you, if you can, to start making this center every week. It's time for Aramaic in Hebrew, and once in Aramaic. And of course, if you need English translation, translate it too. But if you build it up over the year, you'll go over the entire hook and little by little, let them in. But over the year, you go over the Chumash, you will learn a lot of Hebrew and a lot of Aramaic words too. And that helps you in learning. Yes. The photographer? I don't know. <laughs> so the Rabbeinu Shalom is not at all cheating somebody for any efforts they put in. We must understand that we've learned it in many ways. You must understand, as a person, we learned yesterday, if a person tries to become a real pious type, God helps them in that area. If a person tries to persist in trying to perfect his service of God, God will help them. And not only God will help them, God, if the person persists, God will make that person a great person that we learned yesterday. Today we're going to continue with this thing about understanding that God does not cheat any person. God cheats no one. Everybody that does something is rewarded by God for doing it. Not only what they did, but the effort that they had to do in doing it. So the last Mishnah in the fifth period in, in, in Ovos, state this very fact here, I'll find it for you. This is the shortest Mishnah in the, in the, in the, in the, the like, seven. For instance, in this uh, article edition, it's put together with the Ben Bagbag over in the same Mishnah. So is it a separate Mishnah or is it part of Ben Bagbag? Ben Ben Hey Omer, Ben Bagbag, the last two Mishnahs there. Here. The Ben Bagbag is 
pay a, a reward, uh, the, the, the paying that reward. That's Aramaic. But the, I thought it was supposed to be Hebrew. Yeah, most of it is, but sometimes You're most most of the people understand. understand want to make it intelligible to like the audience. You should never feel that you're cheated out of anything. If you have to work harder to serve, God will reward you greater than somebody else. So therefore, among us, we have to work very hard to serve God because we're the ignorant of all. I'm speaking about myself. Of course, you're all knowledgeable and everything. And we're all ignorant and everything. So therefore, the reward we will get will be much bigger than somebody that's much, much bigger, learned and everything. You understand? God is very generous in that direction. And if a person persists, his capacity to, uh, increases. And not only do you get a reward, but you get an increased potential to do even greater a job and a better position of doing it. Now, nobody can learn Torah for you. Nobody, nobody can do the mitzvahs for you. But if you persist and you keep on learning and you keep on doing, Little by little, maybe to us, it may not be noticeable, but eventually we will get to a point that we will do it, not only will do it, we'll do it in a very nice way. And I can't express to you the great joy you will have when you will do a mitzvah and you will see, thanks God, that you can do it so that you feel good about doing it. It's not something you just dashed off. It's something that you see that, thanks God, this mitzvah, I'm doing a very good way, according to my capacity, obviously. But you're not just thinking, treating it as an insignificant effort. You're putting in a good effort. And there's nothing that makes you feel much better, better than serving God. The service of God has many benefits. Besides, obviously, you get rewarded by God and you avoid getting punished. But in addition to that, it makes you a better person. Because, truthfully, how can a person live in this world and get all the wonderful things that God gives us every second of our lives, including our living, and not try to respond to this by our efforts and our thoughts and our mind and our speech? How could we not, how could we be so lacking in appreciation as to not to respond as best we can to God. I don't look at it as necessarily a religious thing. I would imagine it's just a question of decency, if you will. How can, you, how can a person who considers themselves in any way decent unless they try to be decent with God? I, I, I don't understand how a person could even consider himself decent unless they make a bona fide effort continually striving to perfect their performance in the service of God. Nobody says that you're going to be necessarily guaranteed success, but regardless of what you are guaranteed, it is nothing more than what is proper and should be done. I don't know how others will do it. I look at it that how could I even have any, any thoughts of doing anything and make that a priority over doing what God requires us to do. Now, how can I live like that? How can I think like that? How can I even act like that? It, 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 is, it is so improper. Not because God's going to reward me or punish me. It's so improper to act in relation to the Almighty God in anything other than the most altruistic, the most, with every effort you have, with every strength that God gives you to serve Him. I don't understand how it could be possible that a person can live their life and ignore their responsibility and their, and, and, their, and, their, and, their, and their, how can you do this? How can you do this? In this instance, you recognize your earthly parents, your mother and your father. If a person has any feeling whatsoever, they realize that their mother and father has given them more than they can ever repay them. And they didn't repay them. You've got to treat them what the greatest, the very highest respect you have, not because they may be the very best mother and father ever lived, but, but they made it possible that you can get to a point where you yourself can function as a normal human being. And without question, they have been, had many sacrifices and many times that they had to do a lot of things 
when you were ill and when you needed help and when you had trouble and they came to bat for you. Now this is your earthly parents. Now we're dealing with your heavenly parents who, who are more than, than your earthly parents has watched over us and has protected us and has given us everything that we could possibly have and will give us everything we possibly have. How can we not respond to him in like kind? It, it, it requires some kind of a thing. Incidentally, we, we will learn today the concept of, of what type of a mitzvah, what kind of well, usually when you have an avera, a, a transgression, a transgression requires some kind of an action. That's usually the type of uh, a person has a makshava, a thought, and then has a maisa, an action that best based on that thought. And that's usually the way a sin occurs. First a person thinks, and then he does. Or he thinks, and he speaks. Or he thinks, and he does. A lot of times the person gets into a habit. Now, there is a type of avera, the ancient should keep us from it, that you can make an avera just by thinking wrong. And what's that avera? That's avera zora. Worshipping idols, just the thought itself is an improper thing. Right. The thought to do it is in it. The Masha, the Masha in the, the self pullet uh, brings this, uh, this concept. He says like this. We can look at innovating, but first I'll tell you outside. He says this, that the uniqueness of of uh, uh, worshiping idols is that it, has, it is actually a combination of sins. It's not just one sin. It is, it is at least two sins. There's a sin in the thought and there's sin in the action. Whereas in other places, if God forbid a Jew that has a track record of doing proper things, if he has an improper thought, he's going to do a, a sin. Uh, but he doesn't actually do it. God does not take and uh, give him a demerit because he thought he did, was going to do wrong, as long as he didn't actually do it. Uh, the thought itself is a sin in itself, and the action thereafter is also another sin. So there you have a twofold sin. That's why Adora is considered one of the most hideous types of transgressions. No, not the, not the, the not even worse than that. But that ranks up there pretty bad. Now we're talking about mitzvahs. And we have here, we learn here, uh, we learn in the midst of uh, Kisei, the Medish Rabbah. I was learning, so uh, we have that, that saying, mitzvah gerat, mitzvah gerat, vera gerat, vera. One drags it in its wake. If a person does one sin, this gets him acclimatized to do another sin and keeps on doing more and more sin. And the other way, if a person does a mitzvah, this sort of gets them accustomed to do another mitzvah, and it keeps on working on that direction. Uh, so, the, uh, let's go back to this Mishnah here. Ben he Omer from Saragor, Ben he says, according to the pain, that's the reward, according to pain is the reward, if he rove a tsar, according to the majority of the pain, shato sova, that you have to bear, belimoda Torah, in learning Torah, for instance, it's very sometimes hard, certainly cause Polish Koshos. Everything that you, are beginnings are difficult. And I realize that you're all more or less beginners. I'm just a little ahead of you, but not too much. And as a result, it's hard to learn. There's no question about that. Nobody's going to tell me to learn Torah properly is not hard. I remember many years ago when I was, I first started to learn Torah. So Fitz and Yegan, I had to learn at the same time, three different languages that I didn't know. I knew English, but I had to learn Hebrew, Aramaic, and Yiddish, which is basically medieval German written in Hebrew script. Because my Ramoni, most of them couldn't speak English. So they translated the Hebrew and Aramaic yeah. into Yiddish. <laughs> Instead of being a help, it was, yeah. it was an additional barrier that I had to go and do it. So in the case of myself at least, learning Torah was not at all easy. No, I, I, I remember many times I would sit by myself, I said, oh, I would pray to God, I said, this is so hard. Because 
Even when they explain it to me, I don't know what they're talking about. There's nothing more. You feel so helpless. You're coming to learn, and you're sitting, and you're listening, and you're listening to everything that's said, and you still don't know what they're talking about. What does that mean? That means that you got to, God wants to magnify God wants to you. You pray to God, and God makes you want to magnify your your reward. For, for, yeah, from Tara. So he he chose to magnify my reward over and above what the other people did. Okay, you know, you speak the language. That's wonderful. Uh, I remember uh, after many years for Hashem, and I already had to make a landing, and already I was going. I only got to the point where officially I was put there from taking any more examinations in the Gomorrah. Yeah, I was already now learning your idea, become a rabbi. And, but I, Baruch Hashem, I attended the Gomorrah share every day that I was in Yeshiva, even the deep, when I was free from the obligation, because I was not learning Torah to become a rabbi or anything like that. I was learning Torah to serve God. A radical, a radical concept. I remember I, I started the to- uh, yeshiva when I was 22, and the both of and me were 10, 12 years my junior. They could learn rings around me. They learned Gomorrah. I never saw Gomorrah in my life. Uh, little by little, I finally caught up to them because I was a grown man and they were children. And uh, thanks God, God is kind. And it was, I got to the point there where I could learn and everything, so I would go into Gomorrah classes. Even in the higher shurim, I would go. I learned, and I have one rabbi, I, I learned there for many years, and then there came another rabbi, I learned by him. And finally there came uh, a Rosh, a Rosh Mesifte, who uh, was learning the highest Gemara class. So I didn't, I wasn't required to learn there, but I went there to that year anyway, because I always wanted to learn as much as I can, because nobody has to tell me that the, the, the ocean, the, the Torah is, is, is wider than the ocean. I tell you that all the time. There's no question about it. No matter how much you learn, you're just beginning. There's no question about it. So I remember uh, there was one rab- a rabbi, a uh, Gorn Olam, who um, would teach us the Gemara. Thanks God I didn't need him anymore, because I can learn for myself already. But I always wanted to learn, see if they pick up something else, you know, after all. Maybe the Thomas Hoffman, you may pick up something you may not appreciate. And he had a distressing habit, although he could learn very well, and without question, uh, going all of Every time he would come to the explanation, he would get so excited, he would literally shout at you. So I could never hear what the, what it was the, the meaning was. Thanks God I didn't need it, but it was very distressing to me, because you sit and you learn, and it will just come to the point where you want to hear what the answer is. He shouts it. Uh, well, that was his derech, and um, uh, hopefully some of the other time he maybe got something out of it. I got absolutely nothing, because I couldn't hear him. When you shout hard enough, you can't hear a word. And that's exactly what happened to me. Thanks, so Scott, I'll try to put my voice low. I don't do that to you. No, well, whatever it was, it was very distressing to me. Involved in learning. Maybe you said the battle. Well, I like to, I like to hear it. I like to hear it, and I like to be uh, a part of the participant. I don't like to go and sit and learn and not participate. By me, that's not learning. You, uh, learning Torah is you participate. You ask Shaila, and, and you try to develop the thing, like we do here. Everybody here is free to ask any question you want at any time. And we try to follow the questions and the answers and try to have our understanding. At any rate, there is a tremendous amount of, of pressure in learning Torah, especially in learning the Gemara and learning the post scheme, learning the Shulchan Aruch in the right way. It requires a tremendous amount of dedication. You have to literally sometimes almost kill yourself, God forbid, in just putting in the effort and you have to forsake the pleasures of the moment for the sake of developing in yourself the capacity to learn deeper and deeper and deeper in the Shulchan Aruch until a point that you can have a competence and a, a capacity to learn in such a way that you can make intelligence out of it and do it in a proper way. Because unless you do it, come to that plateau and that degree of competence, you are not able to serve your God. 
in the way he should be served. It is not proper to come and approach God and serve him in such a holy thing as the his Torah in a lackadaisical fashion, in a fashion that less than the very best you could put into it. If you are putting the effort, if you truly are putting in the effort, even though it may appear to you you're not making any progression, I assure you that the Torah, the Torah tells us you will make progression and you will know. I know it sounds strange to hear me tell you this because many of you feel that you'll never know. But I assure you, everything I've learned in the Torah tells me this is absolutely true. You, have, you all have good to catch. You have good intelligence. You're not stupid. And you can learn. I know right now, oh, it's the will of God. Not because you want to learn Torah, not because your friends want you to learn Torah, because God wants you to learn. And you approach it with the purity of motivation. And you try to make your life based on principles of Torah and live in such a way that your standards of conduct are impeccable, God will bless you and you will develop and become one of the greatest of the sages of our generation. Every one of you are capable of doing that. Now you think that I am crazy, I am not. It is possible. I had a Talmud that was just like any of you. Could not learn any better than any of you. And I taught him, and at the time he was no different than any one of you in the capacity to learn. But he made up his mind that he was going to learn. And no matter what else was going to happen, he would not be deterred. And he put in the effort, he put in the time, and today he's a grown old. He's written a summary on fire shot. He's a Rosh Yeshiva. And he's very respected. Now, this can happen to any person that has, of course, the need to learn, obviously. I'm not talking about, a, a God forbid, a person that's deficient in intellectual uh, thing, but thanks God you all are not. And you can do it, and the other company that are not here, they also can do it. You must understand, under no circumstances will God let you fall. If you approach him with purity, he will sustain you. And no matter who else may, may, may drop by the wayside and not stand by your side, you will remember that Almighty God will be there to help you every step of the way. And if you persist, you will become, you will become God's Torah, a tremendous in, 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 in servant. All right, Mithala, uh, what you have? I'm sorry, didn't mean to overwhelm you. I was uh, something about what you said before. Yeah, what did I say? Uh, I do have a tendency to speak a lot. You see, Baruch Hashem, uh, you know, I'm a married man, and so at home I have to listen. <laughs> but over here, Baruch Hashem, I'm the Rosh Hashem. Well, so I can, here I can talk a lot, Baruch Hashem. No, you said before, you, 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 you can't understand. What? I can't understand yeah, it. But him, I can't understand it. Yeah. I can't understand it. If a person, yeah, but, if, if a human being does to you good, and every time yeah. you, every time he comes in contact with you, he does good to you. Can, do you, can you go and actually, could you live with yourself if you yeah. didn't try to do good to him? Okay. And how much more so, how much more so in relation to the Boreola that every second of our life he does good to us? How can we not in turn do not do good? And aim to Torah, there's no good better than Torah. Yeah. Torah is good. Yeah, a lot of people live this disturbs me. Yeah, but disturbs me. I am not. You see people. I am not happy when I see people do things you, like you, you see people. I know, but I, I, I am not. I'm not happy with it. I'm not happy with it. I, I consider that such a waste of a waste of life, a waste of a waste of, of opportunity to serve God. How wonderful it is to serve God, and how beautiful it is to serve God in a proper way. How beautiful it is to be able to go and live a life. And after 120 yeah. years, you can say truthfully, I did my level best. I may not have been, but I didn't have such a good head, or I didn't have such a good uh, capacity to do other things, but I tried my best to be as good a Jew as I could. In every way, and in any activity, I never turned my back 
on any type of a mitzvah that I could do. I tried to do it as best I could. I tried to learn Torah as best I could. I tried to improve my capacity to do mitzvahs, improve my capacity to, do, to learn Torah, and I tried to be a better person all the time. And I tried not to be selfish and tried to help my fellow human beings, to be kind to them. The act of kindness is, is very important to God. It's very important to God that we should be decent people. That's what the Torah is trying to tell us, decency. You should be decent in relation to God. You should be decent in relation to your fellow human being. You should even be decent in relation to yourself. Because how can you, after 120 years, look back and say, how could I have missed all these opportunities to prepare for all of Abba by not doing what I should have been doing all the time? How could I be such an enemy to myself? You don't need to talk about other people being your enemy. How can you yourself be your enemy? Even if, God forbid, a person doesn't understand that they have the obligation to serve God, don't they at least understand that they have the obligation to survive? Their own self-interest should go and dictate that they should go and be prudent and try to be decent. It's such a terrible thing when a person commits suicide. And you know, physical suicide is terrible, and a spiritual suicide is even worse. Well, let's go further. So the Bartonur says, how much pain you have to bear in learning Torah and doing mitzvahs, he has the chorach of Merubah. So your reward will be great. In other words, in corresponding to how much you have to put into it, in the effort, in doing the reward, so how much God rewards you. Now, Tetzis Yontov, Tetzis Yontov, Chof Gimel, you have it? That's the outer column, where the Malaysia, Fum Tzarav, Perish Arav, that Tzarav, the Tzarav of Chiro, Atar, according to the majority of the pain, that's the reward. Zev B'Tzchar Atar, he says, we're talking about the reward. We're not talking about the reward. That's not what we're talking about at all in this mission. We're talking about the pain and the bother to do the mitzvah. That is the reward separate besides the reward you get for doing the mitzvah. You get it? It's a separate reward in accordance with the pain and the suffering that you had to do. Like yesterday we learned... Uh, the Medrash Rabbah, the Parish Marzol. The Parish Marzol tells us like this. We have two mitzvahs that say that God gives the reward, tells what we can do. Shakam sending away the mother bird and only eating the baby bird, and the Kibbut Oviyeim, honoring your father and mother. These are the only two positive commandments in the Torah that mentions what reward you get for it, and both of them mention uh, you will be uh, given length of days. And yet the Parish Marzol says, don't misinterpret this because they say the same language, length of days, that, that, that implies you get the same reward for honoring your father and mother as you would for sending away the mother bird. Because in truth, the honoring your father and mother is a much greater mitzvah than the other one. And you have to work much more harder to do that mitzvah. And therefore, the reward there will be much greater than the reward you will get for the other one. Yes. What about the... the parable that I said yesterday? What was the parable you said yesterday? Okay. If, For those that weren't here. This child, his mother, his father was already dead and his mother died when he was born. Yes. And so he didn't have a chance on his parents. So it wasn't that hard. Wait, wait, wait. But he could... Another when they're dead. Okay, but... You have that after they're there. And he did the gender. The addition is that the true, true honor of a parent is for children to become... B'nai Torah and Yerush, Abbas Hashem, loving God, and serving God with all their heart, doing the mitzvahs, there's no greater honor to your parents than that. Even the whole even world will, will bless you, your parents, and say, oh, what wonderful parents this person had, because he turned out, or she turned out to be such a wonderful person, and they should be blessed. The greater blessing you, you can get a better blessing than that for your parents, yes. Even if, Even if they don't know it. It's got nothing to do with it. The true, uh, as a matter of fact, you even get a greater reward in that sense because you have faith that God forbid a person has parents that unfortunately don't know these things. And you still have to go and do the right thing, 
they, you, get, you get the pain because that they are not knowledgeable that in fact what you are doing in fact is the, the best honor to them. Uh, many people unfortunately in our generation where there is so much and lack of knowledge of Torah and mitzvahs, uh, they equate a person that engages in spiritual values, tries to learn Torah, tries to become a better Jew, and tries to do mitzvahs, they equate that as something antiquated and that has no relevance to the type of living. And they equate it. It's unfortunate that I have a child of that nature that all he does is spend his time is learning Torah and doing mitzvahs. Anything really other than that. What, what happened to me? What did I do wrong that I should have such a such a such a child? That I I did I tried my best to try to not to let him come to that abatement. But even you but I got some other children that the Baruch Hashem. They are going in the right way. They are making a living. In the, in the summertime, they go for vacations like decent people should, and they enjoy themselves, and they don't deprive themselves of proper uh, living conditions, and they have the best luxuries and everything, and they live it all. All that is good. <laughs> what happened to me that I got this one? <laughs> and that's the one that saves them, right? And that's the one that, that in fact, is the one that saves the best. And this is told the story. Now, the husband of was 28 years old when he went to him. 28. He, he started later. And at first, uh, his father disowned him. His father disowned him the Razor because he wasn't going the other way. The others were all making a living, making things. All he was doing is wants to learn mitzvahs. Did you ever see a, a thing to fault you, a Yiddish a household that you have such a type? And uh, he wants to support the world. So his, his, he even was, when he first came to the Yochum and Zakai, he had not eaten for several days and there was a bad smell from his mouth and everything. And the story is told about how the Surim he had to go through to learn Torah, but then he had a good visa, he had a good grasp, and he was a very de dedicated student and he had a capacity to retain the knowledge that he learned until he became one of the greatest Kadolim that we ever had. And Horkinus, after a while, uh, he was determined he was going to dis uh, he was going to he was going to make it sure that his son Eliezer was not going to get anything from Russia as Yerusha from him. So he's going to the great Rabbi Rabbi Yochum and Zakai and formalize it. So he comes there and the Rabbi Yochum and Zakai hears he's coming, so he makes a big feast and you know, all of them be coming there, all the great Kedoli. And at the uh, wealthy Jew, he puts a a seat of uh, honor near him and everything. And then right there he, he calls upon Buzzer. He says, go and dash, go and uh, say something. So I didn't want to say it. He says, so he explained something that nobody ever heard of before. He went to such tremendous, Morris says about the Machmakova, whatever it was, he went into tremendous deep thoughts until after he got through, everybody was awed. And his father says, he, was, he said, I came to this to not let him have any Yerusha. I'm changing my plans. He's going to have it all. That's either extreme is not proper, obviously. But the important thing is to understand, according to how much a person puts into it. Now, this disjunctive says, Zeschar Hatsar Vatereach Atzmo. When we're talking about Kuntzar Agro, the reward for the pain and the bother that the person has doing the mitzvah, that's what the mission is talking about. It's not talking about the etzah mitzvah itself, the ed mitzvah itself. That's a different paragraph, and that's a different reward. The reward that we're talking about is how much a person has to work himself up to do in order to do it. And God, of course, being fair and just, the greater the tzar, the greater the reward. Abuschar mitzvah atzmon. But the Tejit Yom said, the mitzvah itself, the truth is you don't really know its reward. Because the fact is, God is very generous. The Lord says, brought us, that even if we do the very smallest things, God makes it tremendous in response he gives for reward. We have no concept, actually, 
of the tremendous, tremendous response of God to any proper action or thought or deed of Makshova. Yeah. What was that about uh, Rabbi? Where was it taken from? Uh, uh, probably. Uh, uh, anyway, um, could, be. could be. Or it could be the, tomorrow. But anyway, uh, let's go now. I would like to learn with you. There is a Gemara at the end of Chulun. Would you read it? Would you read the Gemara in Chulun? Here's the Gemara in Chulun, right here. Sheila, Simele. Here, here, here's Gamora. You go and correct her in case she makes a mistake. She won't make a mistake. Won't make a mistake. All right, fine. I wanted you all to be able to say you learned in the Gemara Chulun too. I know you learned in Scott. This is the same subject matter as we had in Gemara and Kedushi. So now you can broaden your horizons. And now say you also learn Kulin in the first part is very difficult because it's talking about kashras and everything. Dreyfus of all kinds. Kufmem Beis. Very end of Kulin. All right, would you read the Mishnah of Simalea? If they have to have food. If you have to have food and you have, you come across a mother bird with baby birds, you, uh, the Torah requires us to let, send away the mother bird, that's called Shliya Hakan, sending away the nest, literally. It means sending away the mother bird and only taking the baby birds for food. Not necessarily food. Uh, usually we're talking about them for that purpose. Yes. yes but, what, if, what if the scientist has to take a baby to see how it grows in captivity? So he shouldn't take both the mother and the baby? No, not the mother. both generations. And then that will be the... Not only to not take the mother and the babies, but even to take the babies also taking the mother and the babies, but also taking the babies and leaving the mother is also no, improper. That improper, yes. Because, because you've yes, got to have yes, a sensitivity yes, for the uh, sensibilities of a mother. Take them, please, chirp, chirp, my you want them, chirp, take them away. Even if it's to purify a uh, leper, they used to take, do some things with Or whatever it is, okay. okay. Because well, you, you don't, so. uh, oh yeah. Oh, so no. you have a commandment in the Torah that doesn't really require you to invest money in order to do the mitzvah. Because this is you just chance upon it. And there it happens to be, and you find it. What? There's a reward for the severe bird, and you see the mother's babies. Yeah. And if you don't get the money, they're going to foreclose on the shul So. <laughs> well, <laughs> if that ever occurs, you ask the shaman by a great chokhom. I mean, I, I haven't run across rare birds lately. The, a light and so very Easter, Easter is a small coin, a very... They figured out 124th of a dinner. They used to, according to their semi, what they used to get a very dinner, yeah. A dinner, they used to have, a dinner is to be a silver coin. Yeah. And it was to be four uh, dinarim. Uh, it's like a penny. Like a penny. Like a silver. Pizza. No, an Easter, uh, an eight Seven dollars. dollars. Maybe like a dime. Tomorrow it goes out to say that uh, later on, that there's a fluctuation. Sometimes it's only worth six, uh, six frutas to an Easter. There's a devaluation of money, yes. A corn usually weighs about an ounce. A corn usually weighs about an ounce. Why are you so sure? I don't know. It should weigh an ounce? It's no. just Wait, incidentally, I have, I have an ancient coin. Well, uh, an owl, believe it, I'll bring it to, to the class. Thank you. No, I'm talking about <laughs> ancient. That was, that was, that was, that was, it goes back to Roman times. Of course. Well, no. I'll bring I'll bring it over to uh, to, to the class. Really? It was given as a as some kind of a promotion by the bank that I was banking in many years ago. No. It was a small coin, and you can Is see it appears to be uh, they call it. No, I don't know if it, it, it didn't look like a replica to me, but uh, I'll bring it, Belina, and you'll see it. Uh, you didn't even know about such things. I keep my big mouth shut. In order to, you know, to be good to you and to lengthen your days. Even the slightest. In the desert, if he doesn't get the mother bird too, he's going to die. We're not talking about the ordinary situation where you're not starving in a desert. What? How many birds people, are, Most people that I know of don't live in a desert in the first place, and second, don't starve in a desert. Who wants to take either, um, you know, the eggs or a hen for to? you know, chop up for meat, so we should only take one or the other. The mother and leave the children. No, it, it, the proper uh, way to fill this is to send away the mother bird. But what, what if he doesn't get another chicken before sundown? Okay, so the, there's not one mitzvah that's rewarded by a society that doesn't have 
I'll see it's the resurrection of death and hanging on it, meaning of the two mitzvahs that I mentioned in the Torah that has this reward by its side, I'm going to be resurrection of the dead. In other words, if you fulfill these mitzvahs, you will be resurrected by the dead, provided you in, the, in any other direction. What if you, you could do it another sure. way. Uh, it is required for a Jew to do mitzvahs. There are many uh-huh. ways in which a person uh-huh. can fulfill a mitzvah as an alternate for other mitzvahs that he may not have an opportunity to fulfill. We have learned in the Gemara and Rosh Hashanah that if you put on, for instance, if you learn Torah, you get reward as though you put on tefillin. And there are other ways in which if you could do other mitzvahs that come to you, God will reward you as though in fact you did the other mitzvahs. Well, you're obviously, whatever mitzvahs happen to come to your posi- uh, position that you can do, Obviously, not everybody is given the opportunity or the privilege of doing mitzvahs in the same uh, intensity. Some people have opportunity to do mitzvahs in one direction. For instance, some people have opportunity to do mitzvahs like honoring your father and mother. Others, maybe, God forbid, they may be fondlings and they don't have that opportunity. But they can go and engage in other mitzvahs of, of equal import. And I'm sure Almighty God is not going to cheat them in any way from any particular reward, and they can be earned the uh, highest merits uh, by doing other mitzvahs of equal uh, merit. Yeah, but uh, as far as keeping out the aim, there's no greater mitzvah than studying Torah, and yet, and yet, you, you said it. He said it, and it's not mentioned the reward. You just said it. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Long enough, you come to an answer. You said, this is what it is. Chai Moshe. You must understand something. The Rebbeinu is, is is our Father in Heaven. He loves us. Yeah. He is not about to box us out because he puts us in circumstances that we cannot choose and all of a sudden say, Ha! You are no circumstance that you can't do this! That is not fair. That's not fair at all. If he gives us an opportunity to do mitzvahs and God forbid we don't take that opportunity, obviously we're boxing ourselves out. But if he boxes us out and says, I'm not going to let you get to Eretz Israel. Well, you can put a pediment, we never get there. That means that after 120 years, you're going to say, ha! <laughs> that doesn't sound fair. Does that sound fair to you? No way. And very, oh boy, would that be messed up. <laughs> All right. No, of course. Uh, the fact is that the Rebellion well, Center puts us. If he put us in Golish, we must be rest assured. We're placed in Golis because we have a tremendous responsibility and we will have tremendous opportunity to do tremendous mitzvahs that you could only do in Golis. Well, first, uh, when, you have, when you want to do it, if you want to do it, yeah, God no, provides. No way, no, that never happens. You're dealing with God. Yeah. And God will not permit a person that seeks him not to be able to find him. He seeks God with all his heart, with all his might, with all his soul. You will, in fact, find God. Because God does not go and make it impossible for a human being to serve him. That, that, is, that wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be fair. Can we learn further?